Okay, this video is about uh, rotational inertia. I guess we'll call this rotational inertia, also known as moment of inertia. We'll call this rotational inertia 1. Okay, and we'll see where we go from here. Okay, in our class, we have already talked about rotational inertia some, but the pieces didn't all fit together. They didn't sink in. So I'm just going to kind of re-summarize everything we've done and see if it all comes together. All right, so the first thing we did, we took a hollow wheel and we took a solid wheel that were the same mass. I really should have just drawn, used a circle drawer. These are terrible. Um, this will be our solid one. They were the same mass and they were the same radius. And we rolled them both down a hill. Okay, and when we did that, um, we looked at that hill and we said, well, if these two things have the same mass and they're the same initial height, well, then by conservation of energy, these two things should get to the bottom of the hill going at exactly the same speed. So that mgh at the top was equal to 1 half mv squared at the bottom. So we all took these two wheels and we rolled them and we raced them and we found something amazing. What we watched was that this solid wheel won the race every time by a sizable margin. It crushed the hollow wheel. Maybe I'll label that one as hollow versus this one as solid. Okay, or maybe I should actually thicken this wheel. So you can see, oh, okay, this is a big, thick, solid wheel. It's a, ho it's a hollow hoop, I guess, is the way we want to think about it. Okay, so then we were left to question, why? What in the world happened? Why did this take place? And so I kept saying, well, it's, it's all about rotational inertia. And you guys came to the conclusion, it's about rotational inertia. So rotational inertia, if it's inertia, Rotational inertia apparently doesn't just depend on the size of an object, because these two have the same size. And it doesn't just depend on the mass of the object, because these two had the same mass. Rotational inertia is like linear inertia in the sense that it depends on mass. So I guess I'll say depends on mass, because it's inertia. And we know linear inertia is just mass. But it also depends on how that mass is distributed. Okay, now I think all of us in our class understand rotational inertia to that level. Somewhere along the way, we hit this train wreck where we disconnected and didn't get it after this. Okay, so the other piece with this is, um, if I'm looking at it, why does one have more rotational inertia than the other? Well, if I'm looking at the hollow wheel, all of that mass, if I'm looking at the rotational inertia about some point, I always have to measure the rotational inertia around some, some axis. So if I'm thinking of these two objects as spinning around their centers, okay, this hollow wheel has all of its mass concentrated far away from that center, whereas the solid wheel has mass close to and far away, but that same amount of mass is spread out over a much bigger distance. What it shows is that the rotational inertia an object has depend, or it seems to get larger the farther that mass is from the point I'm measuring the inertia around. Okay? Um, and so in a, in a very basic sense, rotational inertia, which we use the symbol I for, is kind of the sum of the mR squareds. Or the calculus version of this would be it's the sum of the m r squared. dm is just a little piece of mass. So if I have a thing that's a continuous distribution of mass, I'm going to cut it up into little pieces of mass that I'm going to call dms. And then I'm going to say that the total inertia for this whole hoop thing is the inertia of each piece all summed together. So the inertia for this little piece of mass this, the rotational inertia for this little piece of mass around that axis would be its mass, dm, times this distance, r, squared. And then I would just add up, this calculus integral says, add up those little bits of inertia for all the pieces of mass that encompass this object, and that'll give me the total. So for something that's a continuous distribution of mass, this is my rotational inertia. For something that's a bunch of point masses, Okay, so isolated fixed little masses, like we've done some things where we have like a mass m and another mass 3m, and they're going to spin around some lightweight bar, let's say, 
and they're going to spin around some point here, okay, and they're going to spin around like this. Well, then the algebraic version of this formula makes sense because all our mass is concentrated at a single point. So the inertia for this piece would be mass 1 times radius 1 squared. This is where the summation comes in. Mass 1 times radius 1 squared for the inertia for this piece of mass. And the inertia for this piece would be its mass, so I guess I'll say 3m, and then whatever this radius 2 is, times radius 2 squared. That would be the inertia, again, using the point mass idea. So one of the things you need to do is be able to pick out, well, when should I be using algebra, when should I be using calculus? That's like a fundamental necessity for this course. Well, to answer that question, if it's individual point masses, you know, like fixed, like you can act like all the mass is concentrated at one location, you can use a summation that's an algebraic summation. If it's a continuous distribution, you've got to use calculus. Okay. Um, so we've done that. We've done some calculus things. We've done some algebra things where we practice calculating the rotational inertia of different things. And then the piece to put it all together was, well, what happens if you have a combination of a bunch of different objects? Okay, so uh, like in some of the problems we've done, sometimes people do crazy things. Like they'll take a hoop like this. So we'll call that a hollow hoop. And someone with a lot of time on their hands and a deep love of calculus has figured out that for a hollow hoop, the inertia for that hoop is just m r squared. And actually, I'll be that guy in a little while here. I'll prove to you that the inertia for that hoop around its center of mass, that's the other thing, is always specify where you're finding the inertia around, is m r squared, assuming this hoop has a mass m and a radius r. Okay. Well, then we could take that and we could also find ourselves a solid rod, something like this, okay, that has a width, just to keep it simple. Let's say that it's got a length, width, whatever, of 2R. So I could take this solid hoop and I could glue it onto this thing and make a more complicated object. Okay, we found that a rod rotated around its center I for a rod that's uniform, okay, so I'm saying this thing has equal mass to length, rotated around its center, it has a rotational inertia of 1 12th mass times the length of that rod squared, or this would be the length of that rod. Okay, so in our case, if I was going to find it in terms of the R's and things I'm given, the inertia for that center of mass, would, or for that rod, sorry, would be 1 12th m, if I say this thing also has a mass m, times the length squared, which is a distance of 2r squared. Okay, so the i for the rod around its center of mass, in terms of the r I'm given, in terms of the variables I've got listed here, would be, let's see, 2 squared is 4. This would be 1 third mass times that same radius squared. Okay, when I go to take these two things and I turn them into a fancy object like a hoop with a rod glued onto it. So I just take these two objects and I turn them into one object. What is the rotational inertia of that combination of things about this center? The rotational inertia of that combination of things, this is where that summation piece just comes back in. If I know the inertia of this hoop around this point, and I know the inertia of this rod around this point, then the total rotational inertia is just the sum. It's I for the hoop around its center of mass plus I for the rod around its center of mass. Okay, so I just sum those up. So I'd have mR squared for the hoop plus one-third mR squared for the rod. The total inertia of this combination of objects is four-thirds m r squared. Okay, now, are these things you should be memorizing? No. This is going to change depending on what I make the mass of the rod or the hoop be, or depending on how long I make them relative to each other, but the concept is what you need to leave with this. So if you've watched this and you've got kind of a concept now of these things, that's good. Um, the calculus for doing these things, <coughs> if time permits, I'll do a calculus video today, but I'm, I'm doubting that's going to be the case. Um, but I, I would say at some point I'll do calculus for, well, how do you find the inertia for a bar 
breaking this up into little pieces of mass DM. How do you find the inertia for a, a hot, sorry, for a hollow hoop like this, breaking up into little pieces of mass? But for now, I think this is the video you guys needed the most, the piece that talks about what is rotational and inertia in the first place, when do I use the calculus version, when do I use the algebra version, and how do I combine two objects to turn into a one bigger object and find the inertia of that combination. So you'll have to let me know if this helped.